Welcome to the Nourishment Mindset Podcast, your guide to good food, good health, and a good life. And now, here's your host, Nutrition Network Advisor and author of the Nourishment Mindset, Dixie Huey. Happy Transformation Tuesday, y'all. Welcome to or back to the Nourishment Mindset Podcast. Something y'all may not know is when I was a little girl, I studied to be a ballerina. I went to the New York, uh, excuse me, the North Carolina School of the Arts. I went to New York a lot too. Um, And Baryshnikov was my idol. I mean, what ballerina doesn't love Baryshnikov? Well, today I am sitting with my modern day idol. This guy is the nucleus of my professional transformation from a wine marketing and management consultant to a health coach. He is the reason that I am healthier at age 45, yes, 45 than 25. And Vinny, I'm going to go ahead and give you credit for the fact that I've almost hit a four-minute plank. Vinny is the founder of NSNG. He wrote Fitness Confidential. That's also the name of his podcast, which is incredible. I inhale that. He has made three films, Fat, Fat 2, and Beyond Impossible, Plus, ladies, he has a modeling past. And uh, most importantly, I mean, all that is amazing, but he's a fishing and shooting Southerner. So hot damn, we have Vinny Tortorich. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny, for coming on. How are you doing today? Good. Uh, Now I feel like I can use the term y'all again. I I don't use y'all at all. You've said y'all three times. All right. (laughs) I'm right back home. Um, By the way, uh, uh, Mikhail Baryshnikov. Uh, yeah. along with Gregory Hines, Helen Mirren, and Isabella Rossellini. They did a movie together. Do you know about this movie? Is Was it Tap or something? Well, no. no. Mm-hmm. Although Gregory Hines uh, does do a great Tap piece in the movie. You're going to have to look this up tonight. Okay. Not tomorrow night, tonight, and Hi. go watch it. Great movie called White Nights. White Knights, that's it. White Knights. And um, yeah, uh, you know what? You reminded me that I love that. When you said Mikhail Baryshnikov, I went, man, what a great movie. That's where I think me and every guy my age, I was probably in my 20s at the time, mid-20s. As a generation, we all fell in love with uh, Helen Mirren. Mm. You ever notice guys will say, who's the sexiest old woman alive? And, and Helen Mirren. We, you know, we all go right. And women look at Helen Mirren and go, she doesn't even seem that attractive. What are they seeing in her? Why do they find her sexy? There's just something about Helen Mirren that we saw somewhere in the mid 80s. And we all went, OK, I'm in. I'm in. And we're all still in. The je ne sais quoi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she's got the she's got the it factor. Yes, the it factor. That is something that you, you're born with or not, folks. So um, before I get into my uh, list of questions for Vinny, I want to show y'all something. I'm going to show this to Vinny, too. This is my desktop. I usually don't have artwork, and I'm no artiste or graphic designer. Um, but when I said Vinny's the nucleus of my transformation to health coach, it's because I heard about him. I started listening to his podcast. I inhaled his book and I met three people who, like Vinny, changed my life. So Dr. Kate Shanahan, author of Deep Nutrition, Nina Teicholz, author of Big Fat Surprise, and Dr. Tim Noakes, I all found through Vinny. And once I read these three books, along with Vinny's book, which was first, and many, many others, Vinny has amazing luminaries on his Friday podcast, that is what helped me heal my own health from decades of calorie counting and undernourishment and and just not having the vitality that I should have. It compelled me to leave the marketing agency that I had built and become a health coach. So Vinny, thank you. Because this really is starting from you. Well, um, I would like to say you're welcome, but thank you for uh, continuing it on. Um, th- that's what this was all about for me when I when I first went on the internet. Um, 
I, you know, I didn't want to tell the truth. I didn't want to go on the internet at all. Uh, you know, I didn't want to do any of it. And uh, my buddy, you know, you know the story, Dean Laurie, a, a Hollywood writer, producer, you know, pretty famous guy. He kept saying to me, you need to put this out there. And I was like, Dean, if, if I put this out there, then everyone's going to know how I get people lean and I won't have a stronghold in Hollywood anymore. And he, he, he kind of explained the Internet to me. And in a weird sort of way, I just started to embrace it. Right. The, just the idea of. Wait, I could just go out there and help other people. And at first, the first thing you want to do is go, well, how do I make money at that? Right. And then I thought to myself, well, I have a job. I do. I do. OK. Why do I have to make money at it? What if I just see now? Listen, today, everyone's trying to figure out how to get rich on TikTok or whatever. Or what, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, everybody wants to be an influencer. The term influencer did not exist in 2009, 2010, when we started talking about this, right? Not everyone had a, a smartphone back then. Most people still had a flip phone, right? So the world was not where it is today. And, you know, the, the idea was, why not just, you know, because Dean kept convincing me, hey, you had cancer, you almost died. Why don't you put it out there? And then once I started putting it out there, there had to be a reason, right? And it's like, okay, what what am I trying to do, right? And what I was trying to do was to just get other people to try this, maybe tell a friend, maybe they'll tell a friend. And you've taken that to the next level. You and a lot of other people have taken that to the next level where you went, you know what? This is too valuable to just keep to myself. Kind of what I did. I, I need to let other people know. And it's fine, you know, that you have a coaching thing and, you, and I'm hoping you charge money for it because that's, you got to make a living. You can't just walk around like the Pied Piper. It's true. And, and by the way, folks, I, I'm not that magnanimous. I, I, I earn a good living online because I own other companies that do okay. So I don't have to charge for this, but do not think that I'm some kind of super duper human being. I'm not. I, I make money doing other stuff, movies, and and you know I wrote a book and all this kind of stuff. Um, so the, I I don't know I, I went off into one of my diatribes. But Thank you. Sorry about that. No, I love your diatribes. That's why I inhale your podcast. So you recently did a clip for Prager U, which of course Corolla turned me on to, and I believe it was called America is Fat but you don't have to be. Tell us about your secret sauce, you know, and what's your summary? What was your summary message there? It was what, about five minutes? It was terrific. Yeah, you know, the Prager people said, hey, you know, they do these Prager U's and they tell you a couple of things, which does not work for me. It has to be five minutes, right? And it takes me longer than five minutes to tell people my name. Right? <laughs> and that was a problem. And then they told me it has to be well scripted because we do these cartoons and graphics around it. So you have to be on script. And I've done three documentaries. Even in my documentaries, I go off. I, I, I read my own book on Audible. In my own book, I couldn't st stay on script. I did notice that because I've, I've listened to and read, but that's okay. That's more content. <laughs> yeah, people got way more content if, in, in in the audio book. Well, now Prager, the people over at Prager, you they're going. You got to be on. You got to be on script, word for word. So whenever you write, we're putting it in a teleprompter, and you need to read it from a teleprompter. And I'm like, teleprompter. If you guys are, I, I, I go into a cold sweat when I hear teleprompter because I, I feel like I look like I'm reading. Did it look like I was reading while I was doing? Did you see the Prager you? I listened to it. So I didn't, oh, so, I, I'll have to look at it. Does it sound like I'm reading? No, it, <laughs> no, it sounds like you. It just sounds like Vinny. Well, because I wrote it. So th that helps. Right. But, you know, and, I think the last I checked, maybe we could check during this podcast, but 
on Prager, I checked it like a week ago. It was over a million views, like within a week or so on Prager. Wow. On YouTube, I think it was getting close to 650,000. So all in all, it was getting close to 2 million views. Wonderful. Right? And you sit there and you go, okay, you know, we're making waves. I need to do more of this type of stuff. Um, and I noticed other people who have done similar content on, on Prager have not done that well that fast. You know, like after a year or two, they might have a couple of million or whatever, but we're at a million within a week. So I think it's doing well for those people. So what's the, what's, what's your takeaway? I mean, we want people to listen to it, obviously, but I love the simplicity of your message. That's what everything just all oh, came together for me from you. Well, you know, the Prager U thing was, you know, we need to get back to fitness middle class. You know, that that's the long and the short of it. And uh, when you go, okay, to fitness middle class, what does that mean? You know, what, what are we talking about here? Well, you know, we now live in a world, and, and my friend Adam Carolla, you know, will, will say the same sort of thing. You know, he, he goes, we live in a world where people are either in safe spaces or octagons. There, there's no middle ground anymore. <laughs> um and he may be he may be right, you know. He really um, is. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, when I was in LA to do that, um, oh, I'm looking right now. I'm at sixty six hundred seventy five thousand yep. on YouTube. Um, so yeah, I'll check PragerU in a second while I'm talking to you. So if if we're if we're in the octagon or the safe space. We're actually doing that in life. People are either running marathons and triathlons and muddy buddies and all triathletes, or we're looking at my thousand pound life. You know, we don't have that middle class of fitness anymore, right? You have, you have Lizzo saying, Hey, I'm, I'm huge and I'm proud. Okay. There's nothing. I, I don't fat shame anyone. Lizzo's a very talented woman, beautiful, by the way. I think she's gorgeous. But I look at Lizzo and I go, you're not healthy. And, you know, you have a lot of fans. And I think you're doing your fans a real disservice by saying, hey, you could be fat and healthy. You could be morbidly obese and healthy. Uh, that's an oxymoron because the word morbid is right in the title of right. the type of obesity you have. Right. Um, so it, it it drives me nuts that we we live in this world, right? Um, of it's this and it's that. And um, I'm just trying to bring back the middle ground. And that that's all I'm trying to do. Nothing more, nothing less. I love it. Yep. You heard it, y'all. It's it reminds me of like a seesaw a little bit like just want to try to be in balance all this is out of balance so um something i learned from you when i found you i was in my mid 30s i'm now 45 i just thought i was pudgy because well you know i was 35 um and also because at the time i worked in the wine industry and it's filled with great food and great wine and great times um I also thought I just sucked at doing math, right? Because all you need to do is count calories. So I, if I eat this dinner with this many calories, I just need to go run and burn it off. Um, this is something I did for 25 years. All day long, I was doing calorie math. And I just thought, I guess I suck at math. This is not working. Well, your documentaries, Fat and Fat 2, do this deep dive into drivers of metabolic disease and chronic conditions you know, why should all of the Nourishment Mindset listeners and viewers watch both of these documentaries? And I'll say rewatch because I've watched them each three times. You know, what what can we learn from your documentaries? Well, look, in, in the past 50 years, um, <clears throat> we've been told one thing, you know, calorie in, calorie out is the only way to lose weight or SECO, as the young kids are calling it. And um you know, it, you have to take in less than you burn. And if you take in too much, you can exercise it away. You know, we, we have all of these things, you know, um, eat heart healthy grains. And, you know, we, we've been sold this bill of goods. And in the past 50 years, we've done nothing except get fatter and fatter. So a guy like me looks around and goes, okay, we weren't ever this fat in the history of, of humans. 
right? As a matter of fact, we weren't fat at all when people were eating more naturally. When I say naturally, not processed foods. So then you have to look at the processed foods and go, okay, what's in the processed foods that's causing people to get fat? Well, you know, sugars and grains are very cheap and they're they're delectable. You you know, it you the more you eat them, the more you want to eat. True. Yeah. And um, so you get stuck in that that cyclone. Um and then there's other stuff, seed oils and all this other stuff that causes inflammation and causes a myriad of diseases. I mean, things I mean, if someone said they had fatty liver disease back in the 70s, we're talking that's 40 years ago. Fatty liver disease back in the mid to late 70s was also known as alcoholic fatty liver disease because basically only alcohols would get fatty liver disease. People who abused alcohol would get fatty liver disease, right? Regular now we have non-alcoholic. They've actually changed the terminology, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So something big had to happen for, for us to have this stuff. Uh, Crohn's disease. I, I never heard of Crohn's disease in the 80s. Now half the people I talk to in consults saying, Oh, I have IBS or Crohn's disease or or you know, you know, some form of it. Celiac did not exist. It's painful. Digestion. Yeah digestion is terrible yeah just all of it is you know people I, I spoke to a woman at this she was like i walk around bloated all the time i feel bloated i can't eat my doctors can't figure it out you know people are walking around feeling like crap yep. and the message keeps coming down the pike keep doing this so i thought when i did fat and fat too well i i didn't plan on doing fat too uh I, when i put fat a documentary out there I didn't, you know, documentaries nowadays tend to have an agenda, right? And if you watch fat, a documentary with an open mind, you could tell there's no agenda. You know, I'm not selling anything. I'm not telling people this. You know, I'm just going, look, here's where we were. Here's what happened. And here's where we are now. I mean, did you see it any other way, Dixie? No, you're you're telling a story. You weren't sitting there like, hey, and to to reverse your Crohn's, take pure vitamin club and drink right. pure coffee club. It was not a um, a commercial interest work of art. It was purely well, information. You know, just to give your audience an example, whenever you watch what I call the vegan propaganda films, <laughs> um, they all have you know you know everything. You know, all you know, when you have a hammer, everything becomes nails, right? And that's all they do. They they just keep hammering nails into the same coffin of you know, hey, vegan is the best diet. Why? All these things. And a lot of what they're telling you is just non truths. You know, they're making up stuff as they go. And yeah. they're quoting studies that don't exist. Or they're quoting real studies, but the results they're telling you are non-existent. They're lying to you when they give you the results if, because they know no one's going to go actually read the studies. Exactly. Except a guy named Vinny Tortorich or a woman named Nina Taisho. So I was going to say, Nina would read the study. Yeah. <laughs> whenever, you, whenever you show a study to a Nina or a Vinny, you know, and by the way, Nina and I, we text all the time. It's like, can you believe this? Can you believe that? You know, it's like we become texting buddies. And, um, but, you know, that, it, that's what the movie was. It wasn't trying to oversell it in the opposite direction. It was, hey, listen, I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't care what you think. I'm agnostic. Here's the truth. That That's it. And then, um, you know, I, I realized that when you're trying to fit everything into a 90-minute movie, and you have people like Ian Felt and Gary Taubes and and Eric Westman and the aforementioned Nina Tyshows and and Ivor Cummins and all of these people who sat down with you, you realize that it wasn't the scraps that ended up on the floor, the stuff that ended up on the, on the cutting room floor, the proverbial floor. It was as good, if not better, than what we put in the movie. And um, even though Fat a Documentary Two has never made the money that Fat a Documentary 1 has made. And we say money because that's how you judge how the movies are doing. It's done quite well in its own right. Like most people would kill to have the numbers 
that Fat Two got on on a brand new documentary. Um, the reason I say it is because Fat One is the number one selling movie that Gravitas has ever put out. Um, that's wow. how big that movie was. Um, so Fat Two, in its own right, has done very well, and. I think critically, people like Fat Two more than they like Fat of the Documentary, one of the best-selling documentaries of all time, which is interesting, right? So that you know that tells you a lot, right? <laughs> well, people do want the truth, and they appreciate people who have the courage to tell it. I mean, that's something that annoys me about our current culture. Is <clears throat> you know this. You know, we all want to be in that safe space that you mentioned, but some of us don't. Some of us just want, we can handle the truth. And that's Actually, what um, have, uh, have you seen my third movie, um, Beyond the Impossible? <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, Beyond Impossible, y'all. So this, this goes into one of my absolute pet peeves. So I, I work with people, Benny, that are vegetarian. I always say I won't. I can't serve a vegan. I respect someone's right to choose what they want to put in their body 100%. And that's kind of a hot topic now, right? With all kinds of things people want to put in your body. But one of my absolute pet peeves is faux meat. And I loved your Instagram video the other day where you had a, a supplement for vegans. <laughs> it was like a steak. <laughs> So to me, you know, I spent 20 years in food and wine marketing, and this beyond stuff is food marketing, bullshit, virtue signaling at its best. I would say, and, and you might know this expression because you're a fellow Southerner, this is putting lipstick on a pig. This stuff, we shouldn't be picking on pigs, first of all, but... <laughs> garbage <laughs> the garbage that they are selling to you for a premium price grains soy inflammatory substances seed oils which by the way thank you for bringing up seed oils earlier because my nourishment mindset listeners know that i have one rule and one rule only for this podcast every single episode we shit on seed and vegetable oils because they are awful. I always tell people, if you want to do just one thing, that's the thing, get those out of your life. So faux meat is marketed as healthier for you. It's freaking big food, pimp and poison. And this guy did a whole entire film to expose it. So tell us more. I mean, this stuff is awful. <laughs> yeah, well, my thing is, I don't automatically go in trying to you know, poo poo, a, a, you know, a thing, right? Well, I'm biased, but you aren't so good. <laughs> yeah, I, I always go, okay, let's see what's good here. It's the only way I could be intellectually honest with anything, you know, I, I don't just look, because that's what vegans do. And we see it now with identity politics, you know, I have, you know, friends on the right, and they'll go, can you believe these these idiots over on MSNBC and I have friends who are on the left. He goes, can you believe these, these people with the MAGA hat? It's like, do you guys understand that you're both Americans and you're, we're all living in this country and there's a middle ground. And they, and I try to explain to people, it wasn't that long ago when Democrats and Republicans can sit at the same table yes. and have a conversation and be friends. And now everybody is picking their corners and nobody, the same thing happens with, Diet wars, you know, diet is like religion. You know, people think, how can these vegans believe it? And then the vegans are going, how can these meat people? And, you know, as a, a, a student of science, I sit there and go, okay, let's find the truth. You know, let's not get upset. I don't know if you notice, but people are constantly telling me I'm an idiot. I, I, the, the, the stuff they used to describe me on, if you go read... I just had a, a comment go viral on my Instagram. It's got like 1.2 million um, views. And so that one has like 15 or 1400 or something comments. Go read those and you'll wonder, it's like, how does this guy wake up in the morning? Everyone calling him an idiot and he's crazy and the whole thing. The same thing happens when you do, you know, a movie like Beyond Impossible. Ooh, the haters. Mm. I um, I I started from a standpoint of okay, 
I read an article and the article said that Tyson Foods, which is a meat company, you know, Tyson Meats and a few of the other Cargill and a few of the other big meat companies were investing mm -hmm. hundreds of millions into the fake meat industry. And I'm like, what? Huh? You know, we're doing what? Why don't you got? And you see companies, you can't hate the companies. They just need, you know, companies are companies. They just need to exist, right? People have jobs and they're just hedging their bets. <clears throat> so I started looking into that. It's like, why would these big meat companies invest in this, in something, in the, in the enemy, so to speak? There's got to be a reason, right? And at the same time, I'm seeing all of this stuff you know, there's this little girl yelling, you know, how dare you? And how dare you? And, and 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 every time a cow farts, the ozone layer just explodes. And like all of this, and I'm listening to this stuff and I'm going, wait a minute. They're saying that. And then in the same breath, they're saying, go eat an engineered food. And then I took the word engineer. Okay, in order to engineer something, <clears throat> In order to make a fake food, there needs to be energy. Energy is heat, right? How do you create heat? Well, you need something to create it. Either you, you split an atom or there's, uh, you know, uh, diesel or coal or something has to happen to create heat, to create energy so that you can make this product. So that was the beginning of me doing Beyond the Pot. I didn't look at, at the healthy aspect at all. I started on the other end of, I, I was trying to answer the question, is this worse than a cow fart? That, that was, you know, when people say, how do you come up with this stuff? I, I was trying to beat a cow fart, <laughs> right? So when I learned that this stuff, like all of the, the different elements, most of them are made in China. Like, okay, they're being made in China, so some kind of energy has to go into that being made. <clears throat> and then I heard that they put it together in the United States. It's like, okay, now they have to fly that stuff here or <laughs> get it here on a boat. So more energy, more diesel being spewed off into the atmosphere. And then once it gets here in a factory, they have to put all this goop together to somehow turn it into what you get as a reasonable facsimile of a hamburger and that takes more energy. So there's energy, energy, energy being used to make this. And we have, you know, Greta Thunberg yelling, how dare you? And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like watching all this going, okay, do, is anyone else seeing this besides me? That's how the movie got started. And then once I decided that I was going to actually put money behind it and do it, I wanted to do something that no vegan propaganda movie has ever done. I wanted to invite some of their top guys to be in my movie. And I wasn't going to try to trip them up. I, just, I was going to ask them the same simple questions I asked everyone else that was in the movie. Uh -huh. Right? And... If you've seen the movie, you've seen the movie, right? Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. I, I actually put their rejection letters up on the screen. Yeah. Notice I haven't been sued by any one of them. They can't sue me because, you know, I have their rejection letters with them signing, you know, saying, you know, you know, and, you know, and my favorite ones where they were going, oh, yeah, I'm busy that day. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and we were like, well, only we're one day that you could possibly discuss. I didn't even give them a day. That was the thing. I was just asking him, would you like to be in this movie? Um, Michael Greger was one of my favorites. Um, he he wanted to know how big my my audience was. And I said, well, how big does it have to be? And he goes, well, you have to have at least this many followers on these different platforms, and you have to have... We wildly exceeded, and I show that in the movie, we wildly exceeded the amount of viewership that you have to have not to mention i have one of the top rated films fat documentary out there and he still went yeah now nah, I'm, I'm busy writing a book that day and again it's like another guy with that day 
<laughs> we didn't we didn't discuss days yet. <laughs> On screen gold. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, no, they're they're terrific. The documentaries, y'all, are just terrific. So Vinny, you you have high integrity. Y'all, he makes himself still, after all of this, reach, success, being pulled in all these different directions, he still does one-on-one -on -one consults. That's how I met him was over the phone. He helped me become fat adapted in 2017, five mm. years ago. You know, you're so active on social media. My son might be your biggest fan. I have a video of him trying to imitate you with your megaphone. <laughs> 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 how to make a documentary you need a hat and a you know megaphone mm -hmm. anyway you, you're out there you're having fun you're honest you're open is this just you or is this part of like your health journey you all you already mentioned having recovered from cancer um you know why are you so giving <laughs> i don't know uh, i i really don't know um i, I kind of come from that kind of family Mm -hmm. you know, um, we were never rich. You know, I didn't grow up with, you know, we weren't poor. You know, I don't have that. You know, we were so poor, we lived in a hole with sticks right. over it. You know, it's, but we we definitely were not rich. And, um, but, you know, I, you know, my parents always did things like, like they, they scrimped and sent us all to private schools. You know, we were in the deep South in, in Louisiana. <clears throat> and my parents were both educators in the public school system. And they were like, we can't put our kids in a public school. So I had public school teachers going, we got to put our kids. So we sacrificed a lot for me and my three brothers to go to private schools. And uh, we all had to have summer jobs and jobs and holiday time and on and on and on. But when you go to a private school and you're not the rich kids. The rich kids didn't look down on us. You know, we, we all just kind of mixed in. But they had, you know, different kind of cars they drove, like their parents drove. And, um, you know, they would go skiing at the holidays. It's like skiing. <laughs> right. Really? It's an airplane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, airplane. I mean, I didn't ride in an airplane until I got a football scholarship. And, you know, but... You know, I, I always got to see what the haves have. Mm. Right? And like take cars, for instance, right? I'm not a real car guy, but when I got to New Orleans and, you know, I, I graduated with a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition and all this stuff, I started working with my clientele in New Orleans. And I took note of what really rich people did. You know, I was working with people up and down St. Charles Avenue. And, <clears throat> and I went, okay, this is in the early 80s, 40 some odd years ago. Rich people buy Mercedes cars. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Most of those cars back in the 80s had diesel engines. And I quickly learned that they would buy these cars at a higher price than you could buy, say, a Chevy. Um, and the reason being is they would drive the wheels off of them. Whereas my dad was turning into Chevy back in those days with 50, 60,000 miles, the car was like done, right. right? These people were driving these cars 200,000 miles and then, you know, giving it to their kids to go to college when it was 10, 12 years old. So I looked around life and said, okay, a Mercedes is a good idea because you only have to buy once. I've always been frugal with money. And it's like, this, this car costs X amount more, but you only have to buy once. Right. And then <clears throat> um, I figured out that Toyotas, this is back in the 80s when they made something called a Cressida and a Corolla and a Celica. Toyotas cost about as much as a Chevrolet except they ran as long as a Mercedes. Hmm. And I looked at that and I went, ah, there's the secret to life. Give a better product and charge less for it. That's, that's how I want to go through life. I want to be a Toyota in life. Hmm. 
nobody else when you when people say where did you come up with that it's like i worked in a toyota dealership one summer that's you know i worked as a salesman okay. back in didn't 82. know that in 82 yeah and i didn't know anything about toyotas because everybody i knew had a chevy or a ford f-150 and you know i'm working at toyota and people would come in that summer and they were bringing cars in with 250,000 miles 300,000 miles making outrageous claims going we bought this car we never changed the oil in it. you know we just added a little oil about once a year <laughs> and we never actually changed the oil it's got the original oil it's got 250,000 just crazy stuff right and i'm like wow these cars are amazing. That's when I came up with this. I went, these are amazing. Okay. Cars. This wasn't like one customer or two. This was like daily. People would bring in 15 year old Corollas and Coronas and all these Tercels and say, just give me another one. I don't care the color. I just need another one. Just like it. Right. And that's when I said, Oh, wow. Life can really work this way. You can, you can over, you can over give and charge less. Right. Uh -huh. And then when the internet came around, we just started doing it for free because I was trying to build an audience to sell the book. Right. I wasn't that virtuous. It was like, please listen to my podcast. Let me build an audience. And then when the book comes out, you guys can buy. And I, I wasn't, if you go listen to the early podcasts, I wasn't baiting and switching. I was telling people, we're doing this because I'm trying to build an audience because I have a book coming out. We actually talked about that on the podcast. And when the book did well, I went, okay, I got to keep doing this podcast because now people are stupidly listening to this. Right. Thank goodness. And, <laughs> and losing weight. <laughs> you know, that was the crazy thing. People were losing weight. And at some point, my friend, um, I'm going to name drop here. Um, Howie Mandel is one of my clients. And, um, Nobody was doing podcasts back then, but Adam Carolla was. And Howie was doing a cameo in one of Adam's movies. And Howie said, yeah, that you, you're doing that podcast thing. As you know, my, my trainer has one, and it's really, really popular. I mean, he, you know, like hundreds of thousands of people tune in every month and all this. And then it, it went into millions at some point. But And Adam was like, yeah, yeah, man get him on the show but it never happened as a matter of fact how we had mentioned it to me he goes hey adam wants you to come on the show i was like all right great you know all right you know but no one ever thought of making that happen and then uh his young producer chris loxamana had me on you know his show he was doing a show and he goes does adam know about you and i said no i don't think so and he goes i think he he knows your name he says he knows your name and I'm, I don't know. Right? And and then they made the um, Howie Mandel connection. And that's how I ended up doing Adam and Drew. And then from there, do you know how many times I've been on the Adam Carolla show? Oh, gosh. Hundreds? Coming up, it's either 100 or coming up on 100, or it might be 101 already. All right. Triple. Which is kind of nuts, right? It's most comedians don't make it on that show more than a few right? times yeah you know? exactly no yeah. it's wonderful I've, yeah I've been I, very lucky i did not know the backstory about loxamana um i got to meet and shake his hand when adam was in naples so if i had known i would have thanked him because it turns out he helped me find you so really yeah yeah because he got you on adam and i yeah Listen, oh yeah, I got thirty plus right. years. <laughs> so, um, so I know the answer to this, but I want my audience to know you. You mentioned you, that you had cancer um, and have recovered for it, and I want to say what's it been 11, 12 years? How have you kept cancer at bay so long? Because my understanding is most people have will have had a reoccurrence by now with your given cancer. Yeah. All right. So the story is, um, I, I had leukemia in 07 and I've been clean since early 08. So, uh, eight to 18 was 10 years. So we're at almost 15 years now, uh, okay. cancer free. And they, they meaning my, um, 
oncologist, my, my blood doctor, my hematologist said, you know, we, you know, the type of cancer you have, we, we've knocked it into what we call remission, but there is a cursory amount of cancer. It just, it, it won't show up on any, on any bone marrow biopsy. It's, it just doesn't show up anymore. So you're, we're calling you clean. Now they had me come in every three months for a long time. And then every six months. And then after you go like a few years, then they let you come in like once a year. And, um, you know, I said to her in one of the early visits, I said, when will it come back? And she goes, your type of cancer, people get it back. It, she goes, look, if you go five years, you're really beating the odds. Four years is about average. She goes, there's a couple of people that have gone six or seven years. And um, there's, she goes, I talked to a doctor somewhere. They're saying like someone has some crazy record of nine or 10 years. Of, but that's just unusual. It's, it's not the norm. So five years. And it became my life's work. And, and I remember saying to her at the time, I said, listen, I'm out in Hollywood. Every one of my clients, they're telling me I need to be drinking, you know, 10 ounces of wheatgrass per day and all this kind of stuff to keep cancer. Is there any truth behind any of that? And she said, no, that's just all hogwash. You know, my, my doctors are real. Like, you know, she's a scientist, you know. She's at Cedar Sinai and the whole deal. And um, I said, so no truth behind all the wheatgrass drinking and macro this and phytonutrient that. And she was like, nope, nothing. And when I'm walking out, she, you know, she was writing something on a clipboard. She goes, oh, you're the guy. You're the Hollywood guy, right? You, you, you know, you, you know, my friend was telling me all about you. You, you have people do low carb. I went, yeah. She goes. Do you do low carb? I said no, not not as strictly as they do because I, you know, I'm, I'm on the bike all the time. I I eat a lot of sugar on the bike, you know, a lot of, you know, because I I got to keep up. But um, I said I don't I don't just sit around eating ice cream if that's what you mean. But I I do have way more carbs than I I prescribe to anyone else. And she goes, um, do that. Mm. And I said really. And she goes, yeah. She goes, uh, you won't hear about it for the next five or so years, but. There's a lot of talk that cancer feeds on sugar. They, they knew this back in 07. You, you hear about it now, right? She was telling me this in the science world. They knew about this in 07. She goes, yeah, cancer lights up with sugar. And, um, it, you know, because cl most cancers are closed cells. They don't feed on oxygen. They need to feed on something. And they feed on glucose. So if you can, she goes, you get glucose out. And that's when I said, you know what? I'm just going to go into dietary ketosis because I used to do it for three months every year anyway mm -hmm. when my cycling season was over with. And um, here we are, let's call it 15 years. Three times, yeah. And no one's studying me. No one's going, hey, how did you do this? Well, we should be, yeah. Right? But I, how do you study one person? It's an M1 experiment. It you know, is. it's like... It, it, you would have to have, you know, uh, 200 Vinnies who had the same kind of cancer. Boom. But we don't. Right. So I'm just happy that here I am 15 years out and no cancer. Thank goodness. And also, thank you. Um, I just thought about this. My mom had a cancer about a year ago. She's OK now. Thank goodness. But you gave me the idea to bring a cooler into her cancer ICU with with food, because, of course, what's served to patients recovering from cancer surgery is garbage. So thank you, because she had real food and no one gave me any shit about it. So um, that's what you uh, your wife, Serena, did for you after your shoulder and, and you helped your parents. So that's, you know, at any, at always we should be eating nourishing, nutrient dense foods, but especially when we're trying to heal from disease or cancer. Yeah, it is it, befuddling to, <laughs> to just know that <laughs> you, you're, you're in the hospital, you're trying to get better, and they're giving you the crappiest food on the planet. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, and, and yeah, as the story goes, I was supposed to be in the hospital, you know, they did something called the ream and run. It's one of the most radical shoulder surgeries you can have. And you're supposed to be in the hospital for four days, they got to put a drain in and the whole thing. 
they pulled my drain out after the second day. They were like, there's nothing coming out. There's no inflammation. There's nothing. And they let me go on the third day. And once they got the drain out, the doctor came in and said, we're releasing you a day early. There's no reason for you to be here. And they told me I'd be on, on um, you know, class, whatever, narcotics for a couple of months. I think on the 11th night, I took a Tylenol, like a regular Tylenol to go to sleep. And that was it. That was the last painkiller. I wasn't on any kind of, you know, any of the stuff that people are getting hooked on nowadays. It's, you know, I don't know what they even call them, but um, none of that. Right? Yeah, the opioids, not necessary because y'all food is medicine. It really is. And he's keeping himself in a very low inflammation environment by being in dietary ketosis and therefore cancer is not welcome in and inflammation is down. So we're going to flip gears here before we close out. I have a very serious question for you, Vinny. Yeah, here we go. My listeners are just going to want to know if you remember that nucleus screen that I showed, or if you just want to pull Vinny up on your phone, you might notice he has an abdominal ab abdominal cavity that is uh, very defined. And I, <laughs> So people are going to wonder, you know, how do you get that? Do you just have the genetics? And and I wonder, have you ever been anything other than six pack of Vinny? Have you, were you just born like you were an infant with a six pack and you're just genetically gifted? Tell us about your washboard apps. Uh, thank you. Uh, because I thought the question was going to be about Gina and Anna and who had the bigger boobies. <laughs> That's usually... What Probably guys Anna now post reduction. I don't know. Uh, it's about even, maybe even now. Okay. Um, I, you know, I haven't weighed either of the women's. Uh, it's tough to weigh boobies. You have to have a, yeah. a booby scale, I guess. Right. Which sounds like the name of a punk rock band, booby scale. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, God, it's hard to talk about yourself. <laughs> well, you, does your do your baby pictures show washboard abs um i've always been um like this um but uh, you know i have three brothers and i have two parents who are still with us none of those people have an ab to look at nor have they ever ever um you know i have a brother who's my height, 300 and he's down right now. He's the lowest he's been in a while. He told me he's at 319, something like that. And, um, oh, no, no, no. That was one of the people I see online, Tim Malian. My brother's at 301. He's about to break into the twos. That'd be good. Um, Mark, when Mark played football um, in high school, he looked like the statue of David. He did. Um, as soon as he got out of football and just started eating pizza and drinking beer, he worked his way up to probably as high as 275, as high as weight. And again, my height. Um, my brother, Mike, um, not in horrible shape, but has a, a gut, you know, 61 year old man that I've never seen an ab on Michael since when we were kids, he was wiry and thin. But as an adult, I, I don't think he's ever been ripped out my brother frankie hmm, can lose some weight so no one in my family um mine came about because of you know sports i wasn't naturally gifted as an athlete so i spent a lot of time in the gym a lot of time working on what you know they say if you want to be a good athlete work on what you're bad at mm. so i spent a lot of time in the gym um i didn't have many friends growing up you know i just you know, I was in a garage, right? So because of that, the abs, just like with Mark, the other football player, the abs came around at some point. When I was 25-ish, tell you a little story here you probably never heard. I was at... um um 
ja New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival, Jazz Fest, as they call it now. Yeah, that's a popular. I have friends who go to that every year. Yeah, it used to be a lot smaller back then, but it, it was growing every year. And, you know, it's it's right. It was like late spring and no one has a shirt on. Hell, most of the women don't have a shirt on. <laughs> now but, it's a party. <laughs> yeah, you, you get enough booze in people. There's not a whole lot of shirts yeah. on. But, well, y'all have like drive through booze in New Orleans, right? Like, Yeah, yeah. You can it, drive through daiquiri stands. Um, That still exists. I tell that to people and they think I'm making that up. Oh, it's for real. Yeah, so I was at Jazz and Heritage Festival with um, with my friend um, uh, Renee and her husband, and they were in their mid thirties. And Renee, her husband, he wasn't fat, but he had low, you know, he had low, you know, um, low spread going on. And these two black women walked up to me, and they. And I, I'm, I'm saying black women because of what they said to me. Um, one of them said, if more white guys looked like you, we'd cross over. <laughs> and I took that as the world's biggest compliment. Two women walking up to me saying, hey, you, you, know, you look good. And Bob, the guy, Renee's husband, said, does this happen to you all the time? And I went, no, of course. I, I'm, I'm glad it happened in front of someone because. Right. You know, no one will believe you. Sure, Benny. No, uh -huh. one, no one walks up. He just walks up to you. And go, oh, my God. You know, but that happened. Right. Maybe they were a little inebriated and they, you know, yeah. their guard was down. And, sure. and they, you know, they were probably looking at me through beer goggles. But Bob was like, wow, these women just came up to you and just complimented you and i went yeah it was pretty cool and um i was looking at one i'm going i wonder if i can get one of those you know sleep with me tonight. you know i'm like checking them out right and then uh renee his wife said enjoy it while you while you can ah uh, right because once you hit said, 30s mm. and uh, yeah i said well what does that mean she goes by the time you hit 31 or 32 like bob you're going to have the middle age spread. She goes, you don't, she goes, you realize that you cannot battle against that. She was saying that as if it was a fait accompli. Right. And I said, Renee, I can guarantee you that when I get to 30 or 35 or 40, I'm not going to have a gut. I don't know how I'm not going to have a gut. And I don't know if this is, a, I'm just not going to have a gut. I, I will make it my life's work. I've already made it my life's work not to let this happen. And I almost let that go. I remember thinking around 27, you, you see, you didn't think the answer to this would be this long, right? No, but I love I, this. I don't know. I haven't ever heard this. So I was like 27 or 28 and uh, about 28. So um, I get a letter. Hey, it's 10 years since you left high school. We're having a reunion. And I went, oh, my God, I can't yeah. wait to see all the other kids. Oh, my God, it's great. So because I, I'd moved away, a lot of them didn't. So going back to Louisiana, I, I was in Louisiana. I was going back down to Donaldsonville. And, and I was sitting in a car with my, my buddy Todd and his wife. They, they gave me a ride there. And I went, oh, my God. Look at that. They, they've they invited some of the parents. I didn't realize that. And they were like, what are you talking about? I said, look, that, that's Mr. Duga over there and his wife. And it's like, no, no, no. That's... That's, that's, that's your classmates. And these people had gained the same kind of weight. They started looking like their parents. See, I hadn't seen anyone in 10 years. And in 10 years, they had become their parents. They were getting fat. They were getting jowly. They were getting, they weren't morbidly obese, so to speak, but they, they were looking older. It was on. Walking like they were older because mm. they have, they're, they're now carrying this, right? And right before that reunion, I was thinking, you know what? You're still working out like a maniac. You're still eating like you're getting ready to compete in something tomorrow. I'm going to let it go. But after that reunion, I said to myself the next day, this is never stopping because as soon as I stop exercising, as soon as I stop eating right, as soon as I stop all of this, I'm going to become that. Right. And call it vanity, call it whatever you want. 
but that's kept me in shape my entire life. It's great. And you always say you can't outrun a bad diet, which for me, this like calorie counting, obsessive triathlete person, the first time I heard that, I was like, ooh, wait, I've been trying to outrun a non-optimized diet for decades, like count calories, burn calories, yada, yada. So I do appreciate that very much about you because you of course, it's uh, it's important to hit the gym and be active and be vital, but what goes in has to be just as important. So I appreciate your spreading that message. Oh, thank you. And, and and it is true. You know, it's people say, well, if you don't need to exercise to lose weight, why would I exercise? And it's like, well, because it's the fountain of youth. You know, it's two different things. Um, exercise is to keep you your muscles and bones and ligaments and everything in place. Also, it keeps your, your cardiovascular system, your, your Krebs cycle, everything strong. And then you eat right in order not to be morbidly obese. And then, you know, the two come together and you can look halfway decent, I guess, throughout your whole life. Yes. So here we are. Um, we're, we're coming toward the end. Um, so the other day I was looking at one of your, I believe it was an Instagram video and I had some, um, sparkling water. I love sparkling water. And you were talking about how you'd rather have people, uh, use tobacco than drink soda and diet soda. <laughs> spit the water out all over the place because I have a friend that has in the past given me shit because my son who's nine has never had a soda or a diet soda, I I say, I would rather him smoke. And I mean that. And she was saying, well, that's bullshit. You can't actually want your kid to smoke. And I'm like, no, that's how much I hate soda. So would you tell us why soda is so bad? Please emphasize for the listener, because I feel like a lot of people, they got that can of soda, they just don't want to put it down. Yeah, you know, look, um, actually, I can make a case for <laughs> I can make a case for like Coke, you know, just regular Coca-Cola or any kind of just sugary soft drink being better than diet sodas. Yes. Yes. If I had you to know, one, do the real one. Yeah. Yeah. At least, you know, you're getting, you know, carbonation, you're getting some caramel color and you're getting sugar. Corn right? syrup. You're getting, you know, corn syrup. So at least you're getting, you know, you're getting 43 grams of that sugar. Right. Whenever you're taking in these diet soft drinks, it's a carcinogen. Uh, it really is. It's like drinking a cigarette or drinking several cigarettes. So, and the point I'm I'm always trying to make is, well, you wouldn't smoke a cigarette because you don't want, you know, that tar and nicotine in your lungs. You know, people always say to me, is there any kind of smoking that's actually good for you? It's like, no, you know, there is no smoking that's good for you. Um, I, I can make a case that at least cigars don't go into your lungs. And there's nothing inherently bad about nicotine. But you won't get tarred lungs from a cigar, you'll get mouth cancer or throat cancer or something like that. Or not, you might not, you know, most people who smoke do not get mouth and throat cancer, but you, 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 you got to get something right. When you smoke, it's it's like the diet soda of tobacco because they've added all kinds of other stuff in it right. that goes into your lungs and it creates this tar and it covers your VLI and the whole thing. And it causes lesions and cancer and whatever, you, whatever else you, you want. Right. There's no smoking that's good for you. Right. The same is with soft drinks. There are no soft drinks that's good for you. Like a Coca-Cola is like the cigar. At least you're not getting the tar and nicotine into your lungs. Okay. Right. But you're going to get mouth cancer or throat cancer, maybe, right? With the other one, the diet soft drink, it's like having a cigarette. You're now putting a, a carcinogen in your body. It's That's a bad analogy because you shouldn't be smoking anything. But then again, you shouldn't be drinking any of these soft drinks. And then people go, well, what should I be drinking? I don't know. There's water. How about that? Water. <laughs> Water, there's milk, ever hear of it? And coffee is coffee. I got something y'all can be drinking. Now, this looks like wine, okay? Yeah. This looks like wine, but it ain't wine. Olive oil. Yes, Vinny taught me this. I just put my olive oil in here because I like to be fancy. Yeah. Vinny taught me you can hit olive oil. 
Do you just yeah, olive oil is one of the healthiest. People always say, "What? Tell me some of the supplements you take, right?" And I, I don't talk about my vitamin company. I, I own a vitamin company for your audience. So, vitamin Club, magnesium, and B twelve. I love it. Yeah. So people go, what are some of the most important? Do you take the, the question is, do you take any supplements besides the ones you make? And the answer is yes. Um, I take olive oil and they'll go, yeah, but supplement. I went, yeah, olive oil. That's a supplement. You know, it's, you know, you, the stuff you get from olive oil, you know, is just incredible. And, you know, even before I used to make fish oil at Pure, Pure Vitamin Club, uh, I used to tell people, go take a good fish oil. You're going to get the EPA to DHA. You're going to get a good omega-3 to omega-6, you know, combo. Go take fish. Now I make one, right? But before I made one, um, I would tell people, go get those. Go get those. Very important. Olive oil. We should be running on oil. Olive oil, fish oil. I mean, the the the, the people up in uh, the Inuits, we used to call them Eskimos. The Inuit people had no heart disease, no tooth decay, no nothing for a gazillion years. And they literally lived on oil. They lived on blubber. They lived on fish. Fish is full of oil. That This is how these people lived. They didn't get heart disease and or tooth decay until we started going, hey, you want yourself a moon pie? How about a ho -ho? <laughs> You want a moon pie. Do people still say moon pies? Oh, I think there's moon pies. Yeah, you got to go to like on the way to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, places like that. There's moon pies yeah. gas station. But you uh, know, I, look, I mean, the Eskimos, we used to have something called an Eskimo pie. They didn't I, even eat that. No. Yeah, no, that was not Eskimo approved. I actually worked with, gosh, I wish I could remember her name, but she was this just top level journalist in the wine industry, a real superstar, but she grew up in Alaska and she shared with us. My favorite thing about the wine industry is sitting around a table with farmers and chefs and people just, you know, breaking bread. I know that no sugar, no grain, but eating food, sharing food, sipping wine. And she told, we were talking about the craziest stories we, we had in our lives. And her, her, her kind of crazy food story is their delicacy growing up in Alaska when you really were celebrating seal fat and whale fat. And that was the delicacy, combining yeah. seal fat and whale fat. <laughs> so there it is. That I have never done. Um, Vinny, tell us if there's anything else you'd like to mention, or please just tell us how to find you. I mean, you're everywhere. Where is Vinny not? But By the way, um, the Italians, people don't know this because everybody thinks Italians just eat. Um, you, you reminded me of this. People, oh, you guys just eat a bunch of pasta or something, right? It's like, okay, that's kind of racist. Um, you ever hear of you ever hear of lardo? Yes. Yeah, it, it, lardo is it, it's it, you know it's it's like this you know the salami or it, it's salumi. It's you would have to go and and whenever you go to Italy, like whenever I'm there, I'll get lardo. And like I, when I was climbing, um, I was climbing Mount Paradiso, uh, a glacier in Italy, and halfway up, we stopped in this hut. And I was like, oh, man, I, I need some fat. And the guy goes, you're just in luck. We got some lardo. He, he was saying it in Italian. And I was like, oh, God, you guys, they had lardo and espresso. And it's like, I think I just moved here. I'm not yeah, leaving seven. right here. Who needs to climb the rest of this mountain? I'm going to stay in this hut for the rest of my life. With the lardo <laughs> and, and the I know it, it's a, you taught me. You are the one. It's okay to eat fat. I mean, that's I name my freaking company Favor Fat. Like it's the world yeah. should run on fat, man. The right fat, of course. Um, but yeah, Italy's wonderful. I married an Italian Irish, and so I got the best of both worlds. I got the chef and the the party guy all in one. So. So where you do we find you? Do that. Um, you can find me. Uh, go to vinnytortoris.com. That's a mouthful, but I, you can find me there. I'm on Instagram every day. I'm on Twitter day and night. Um, I, I'm out there. You guys can find me anywhere. Um, you can you know go check out podcasts. Podcast. Um, 
Great, y'all. It's so entertaining. What he said about the booby scale, if you have that kind of humor like I do, my best friend says that I have the humor of a 13-year-old boy. It's not like you're Mr. Serious, I need you to drop and give me 20 on your podcast. You're a, you're a lot of fun. People no, well, we usually get hammered because people say, oh, you guys don't give enough fitness advice. It's like, I got 23,000 podcasts out there. Right. Go back in time. No, for 23, 20, what is it, 2,200, 2,300 podcasts. We've been doing podcasts for 10 years, five a week. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we tell a few jokes here and there. Yeah. You know, you have to. It's easy to yeah. swallow for sure. Yeah. Benny, thank you. I think I see a Vishla curled up. Is that a Vishla? How do you see? How do you see I that? I have a mirror, but I saw him or her get up and circle. Oh, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, I, yeah. I'm looking now. He's. I love a Vishla. Yeah, that's that's the third one in a long line oh, of Vishlas. Um, first, I had Sophia Loren, and then I had um, uh, Stella Dubois, and then uh, now uh, Bonzo. Hey, Bonzo. Bonzo, dude. Bonzo, you, come here. Come over here and say hi. No? no. See, we went, we, we I went see for a little. A, the face. My Newfoundland walked by in the background during, but he's, yeah. he's lazier than Bonzo. <laughs> well, Bonzo just did. We did. We just did a little run jog, right, Bonzo? Oh. Did Daddy make you too tired? Looks like Lord. it. <laughs> Daddy's going to give you some lardo later. Oh, perfect. Well, you yeah. are phenomenal. Thank you so much for your time. I, as always, I just, every time I tune into Vinny, I learn a little bit more and his, you know, weekday podcasts are super entertaining and great chock full of information. And then are you still doing the Friday luminary? Like that's where I met all these people that have helped influence me. So if you want more of like the science or the medical or research angle, the Friday shows are just Chock full, but still fun. Still fun. Yeah, no, I I learned more on that. I look forward to doing the Friday shows because I learned so much from these guys. Um, they're the best. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're terrific. I wish y'all a wonderful holiday, and I just thank you so much for your time and for everything you have done for me. So with with gratitude, appreciate you, and um, y'all know where to find me. I'm also on Instagram, Nourishment Mindset. As I said last pod, if you will rate, and you don't have to give a five star. If I deserve a one star. Give her a five star. She's good. <laughs> if I deserve a sucky review, that's fine. But if you give me a review, I will give you a free signed copy of my Nourishment Mindset book coming out in January. The holidays are not perhaps a, a great time to gift a book about, you know, becoming your best, most vital youth for real whole foods and pleasures of the table. But January sure as hell is. So thank everyone. Thank Vinny. Go find him. And, and please just again, sometimes, you know, it's a holiday. We fall off the wagon. I don't really, that's not the mindset I espouse. Um, every time you sit down to nourish yourself, I'm literally at my dining room table. You know, that's an opportunity to invest in your health bank. So think of it that way. Get rid of the calories. Get rid of the steps. You know, be a rebel. Be a rebel. Count your blessings. You are worth nourishing yourself. You really are, yourself and your family. So happy holidays, y'all.